All rise. You may be seated. This is uh, episode three of the trial of uh, Disney Lucasfilm for the murder of the Star Wars franchise. Charges were introduced a few weeks ago. Uh, Mr. Ng, what charges will we be discussing today? We will be discussing account number two. Uh, the film threat jury on behalf of the citizens of the Star Wars fandom charges Lucasfilm Disney for the offense of fraudulent misuse of canon. On or about the 30th day of October 2012, Lucasfilm Disney did unethically and fraudulently misuse canon to change the mythology of Star Wars to fit particular narratives. They allowed Kathleen Kennedy to mandate that the force is female and rewrite historical Star Wars events removing instances she deemed problematic, such as Slave Leia, Slave One, and positive, rail, positive male role models. This created more canon issues than what would have been created through interesting storytelling. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ng. And uh, a reminder to our jury, you are to listen to the evidence on both sides of the defense and the prosecution. You should keep an open mind and court is now in session. Mr. Ng, today, uh, as always, we are joined by Mr. Todd Blackwood. Uh, Mr. Blackwood is our court sketch artist. He will be providing sketches of those presenting for the defense and the prosecution today. And you can follow Mr. Blackwood on his Instagram at BlackwoodPDX. Thank you, Mr. Blackwood, for providing some much needed levity to these very serious proceedings. Uh, we're about to bring on your honor event. before we begin i'd like to make a yes. motion i'd like to make a motion that you instruct the jury to slap that like button and subscribe to the film threat youtube channel yes uh i your your motion has been accepted please uh smash the like button we've got uh, nearly 500 people now watching live smash the like button and subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed if you would like to continue to follow this case. Today we are discussing count two. And now we'll be joined by the members of the prosecution for today's proceedings. Uh, Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Thank you for joining us today. It's an important issue to be discussing and I'm happy to be here. Uh, the cultural vandalism that has been shown by the Disney Corporation cannot stand. And I'm here to hopefully defend imagination connoisseurs the world over. Thank you for your presence today, Mr. Burnett. My uh, Mr. Mr. Steiner, we're having some technical issues earlier. Uh, Mr. Steiner, uh, can you hear us? Okay. 
Mr. Steiner is here. He, uh, he is working out some technical issues. And it's Can not you hear a me all right? Uh, you sound like a robot, which would be perfect <laughs> if droids were a part of this trial. I assume at some point droids will be. Uh, you're having some technical issues. Uh, uh, why, don't, why don't you leave and come back and, and we'll get back to you. Um, on the defense, we have Mr. Ozark. Matt, o uh, uh, is it Ozark Matt or Matt Ozark? Ozark Matt, Your Honor. Thank you. Ozark Matt, Mr. Matt. Yes. Thank, thank you for joining us today. We have Become the Knight. Hey, how are we doing today? On the defense, thank you. Uh, I would have expected you to be wearing uh, a blazer, sports jacket. I will accept this. That's a very nice uh, wine-colored shirt. Thank you for uh, your Thank presence. you, Your Honor. Uh, forgive the weight gain. None of my blazers fit me anymore. In my profession, uh, leather jackets are the preferred outerwear. Well, uh, look, I, I appreciate you making the effort. And also joining us as a witness today for the defense, rocking the beige, is Mr. Chato. Yeah, so I'd just like to say that Alan's last name could use some vowels. Uh, we, we've all thought that. I object, Your Honor. My I'm last sorry. name has the right amount of vowels. <laughs> Which is zero. <laughs> okay. Uh, before we get started, a reminder again to the jury to listen to both sides, and here's how this is going to work. We'll have approximately a 30 minute, 30 minute total presentation from the prosecution first, and then the defense, who will discuss count number two, which uh, Mr. Ng read at the top of these proceedings. After the, after the uh, prosecution presents its case up to 30 minutes-ish, and I will be fairly liberal about the amount of time. Uh, the defense will then have their opportunity. We will have a brief recess and then move on to open debate for the last half of today's court proceedings. Uh, on the prosecution, who would like to go first? We uh, haven't discussed this, but my esteemed colleague uh, certainly can go first if he chooses to. Uh, we have lost your esteemed colleague. So that means you, Mr. Burnett, are up. You're up first. Uh, Al, Mr. Ng is here to support on the prosecution. Mr. Burnett on the charge of fraudulent misuse of cannon. Uh, please present your argument. Well, first of all, one of the things that Disney did when they purchased Lucasfilm, and I, I would like to point out, first of all, that George Lucas bought, uh, he, was, he was paid by Disney for just over $4 billion for the franchise. He was paid $2.21 billion in cash uh, by Disney, and he was also paid 37,076,679 shares of Disney stock. Uh, if you just round that down to $37 million, Today, the Disney stock price means that George Lucas was actually paid $5,404,000,000. So George Lucas has made an extra $1.4 billion on the deal, which means Disney continues to pay George Lucas in his stock dividends and money. I would like that to go on the record, please, uh, as showing that Mr. Lucas is continuing to handsomely benefit from Disney's payment of Star Wars. And I would like to say also for the record that uh, if you ever paid $5 billion, $400 million for something, I would think that the being the custodian of whatever it is that you paid for would be of the utmost importance to you to make sure the value of something you paid that much money for was protected at all costs. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see that as the case. And Disney shareholders should be very aware of that. Anyway, one of the very first things that Disney did when they took over Star Wars is they eliminated the expanded universe. And the expanded universe, according to Lucasfilm, was considered canon. The books were considered canon up to the point that Disney uh, took possession of them. For instance, uh, Cobb Vanth, um, while actually he was in a novel that was published by Disney, even Disney couldn't keep it straight. In the Aftermath novels, Cobb Vance's history backstory was changed when we saw him 
in The Mandalorian, which already Disney couldn't keep their own canon straight. But getting rid of all of Star Wars canon uh, from the expanded universe and then later cherry picking that canon, taking characters, taking situations, things that they they just chose to use, whether Dave Filoni wanted to do it or whether uh, whoever wanted to do it. They've been doing that. And by doing so, they've both diminished the canon that Lucasfilm had created with their great literary works for the last 30 years. And also, they, well, uh, I, I find it inexplicable that not only did they render the books non-canon, but then they've gone back in and tried to make them canon again but changed. Uh, that shows immediately how uh, uh, something that they did as soon as they took possession of the franchise, that they first laid down the law and then completely went back on what they were doing with the canon of Star Wars. Now, admittedly, this was canon that appeared in literary form and video game form and not necessarily on screen, but it was definitely considered canon by Lucasfilm that Disney later changed. I think the most egregious example of changing canon uh, shows up in the final Skywalker saga film, The Rise of Skywalker. Uh, that would be Chief Palpatine's return. As we see in that film, the first, the first thing we learn as we watch The Rise of Skywalker is the dead speak. The dead speak. Well, I guess we've seen force ghosts speak and all of that, but uh, they don't exactly broadcast their voices to the galaxy. Uh, in this case, we have Emperor Palpatine, who we saw definitively destroyed at the end of Return of the Jedi. Um, he was thrown over a, a railing by Darth Vader in the Imperial Chambers. The Death Star exploded, and he was definitively dead. Ah, well not according to J.J. Abrams and The Rise of Skywalker. They bring back Sheev Palpatine, inexplicably so. We don't know how he came back, where he came back from. Uh, I would say that that's one of the most, not only egregious canon violations in any medium, but perhaps the most egregious canon violation in any motion picture ever made. Sure, having characters come back from the dead is a time-worn trope of science fiction, fantasy, and horror material. But let me just say that at least we get some kind of plausible explanation. But in this film, not so much. Um, you know, for a space fantasy like Star Wars to, to strain credulity in this manner um, is something that I've never seen before. And it certainly was unearned. It's something that was beneath the franchise and even beneath a filmmaker that I hold in not very high esteem, like J.J. Abrams, who violated the Star Trek canon over and over again. So why it's surprising to see that he brings back Chief Palpatine in Rise of Skywalker for no reason at all other than just to do it should not be surprising to anyone. It, also, let me just point out that uh, with the shoddy treatment that the Star Trek franchise was given, um, I don't quite understand why J.J. Abrams was seen as being the golden boy of the Star Wars franchise over at Disney, but be that as it may. So for my first evidentiary uh, entrance into the record, I want to use not just the Legends stories, but Chief Palpatine would be my first example of a canon violation in Disney Star Wars. And uh, I don't know if my esteemed colleague is back. Uh, the, the, your colleague is having some technical issues. You have extra time, Mr. Burnett. And um, I know some people are going to accuse me of being biased in this trial. I'm no <laughs> more or less, less biased in this trial than a Supreme Court justice uh, who is biased. Uh, so there you go. Um, we're even getting comments. We're live also on Rumble. I, I might add, you may continue with extra time. You have at least another another uh, ten, ten or fifteen minutes, Mister <laughs> Burnett. I have I have watched you many times on live streams that have gone all right then countless uh, hours. So so uh, it's unfortunate, you know. This is why we have a prosecution team. Unless Mister Ng would like to add, um, you you do have extra time, Mister Burnett. 
Well, let's uh, uh, okay. Let's um, let's go on to talk about the the actual. Uh, let's talk about the Force Awakens for a minute. Uh, in the Force Awakens, we are supposed to believe at the end of Return of the Jedi, the galaxy has been liberated from the uh, stranglehold of the Empire. The Emperor has been defeated. Vader has been defeated, and Luke has finally made the transition to becoming a full Jedi Knight. When we begin, if you're, say, six or seven, and you're watching Star Wars for the first time, and your parents have taken you all the way through episodes one through six, and you sit down to watch episode seven, what are you left with except as a seven or eight-year-old dealing with the fact that your heroes that you followed, well, for six movies... Uh, have been completely discredited and destroyed. Most specifically, the character of R2-D2. R2-D2 spends the entirety of The Force Awakens under a tarp, off in a corner, in the base of the now Resistance. Um, I don't know what they're resisting. I don't know what incompetent <laughs> boobs allowed the First Order to rise up and build a super weapon in striking distance within the heart of the Republic. I don't understand anything about the Millennium Falcon sitting on some lost world of Jakku, uh, somehow being liberated from the possession of Han Solo. I don't understand any of that. None of that is necessarily a canon violation. It just makes little to no sense in any kind of storytelling capacity whatsoever. Uh, I don't even know why anybody would s turn that in as a first draft script, much shoot it, and much less sit in an edit bay and say to themselves, oh, this is good. Now, of course, it made $2 billion, so what do I know? But what I would like to say also is that we have seen the ways of the Force in the first six Star Wars movies. Now we are presented with a character named Rey. We don't know who she really is. We don't know where she's from. Uh, we do know she can certainly uh, know her way around a crashed Star Destroyer, which is fine. She's probably gone all through that because she's a scavenger and that's how she makes her living. Uh, however, um, we learned from Han Solo that traveling through hyperspace ain't like dust and crops. Well, I would say that Rey has not done much more than dust crops in the, the sand dunes of Jakku. And yet, and yet, uh, the first time she's behind the throttle of the Millennium Falcon, she's able to pilot the Millennium Falcon better than Han Solo could, maneuvering, making, making maneuvers through the Star Destroyer as if she was born to it. And apparently she was because she was born to everything. She was born to wielding a lightsaber. She was apparently born to be best pilot in the galaxy. She's also born to be the best desert scavenger. And I would say that one of the best things about the Star Wars franchise, especially the original trilogy, is the idea that the Force surrounds us and binds us. But you're not just tapped into it. You might be Force-sensitive, yes, but in order to control the Force or use it to give you abilities, you have to study the Force. You have to train the Force or with the Force. You have to be... And it's not something that just shows up. And I would say that Ray, knowing how to pilot the Millennium Falcon, I don't know if you could say it breaks canon. It's just simply unbelievable. It's simply something that shatters the illusion of verisimilitude and shatters the idea of, of suspension of disbelief for an audience. How is it she's able to fly the Millennium Falcon? She's never been, I mean, first of all, it took me, it was hard enough for me to learn to drive a car when I'm sitting off center. But if you're sitting off center in a Carillion freighter, how are you supposed to be able to maneuver? I mean, that's gotta be a tough job. We've never seen her behind the wheel of any kind of a ship, much less the, the Falcon. And, and a ship that's been souped up for speed and maneuverability, and yet she sits behind those, those controls as if born to it. This is not what Star Wars tells us. You might be born to something, but you have to work for it. You have to study it. You have to channel it. Uh, this is, I would say, ultimately a canon violation because Rey is shown to be strong with the Force, but before she even knows she is, she's already performing miracles. I mean, even Jesus had to be 30 years old before he's turning water into wine. This is not something that happens normally. And um, for me, for this aging Star Wars fan, I found it quite offensive. It destroys the entire lessons of the first three films of the trilogy. Uh, I mean, 
It made me feel entitled, not unlike Gen Z is, to get everything they want whenever they want it. And that's what rape is. She's the perfect example of the modern age. Everybody's entitled to get whatever they want. Hey, if you want to fly a Carillion freighter, go right ahead. You're going to be great at it. If you want to, I don't know, wield a lightsaber, go ahead and do that too. You go ahead and you take on somebody who's been studying with the Force and who's powerful with the dark side. You can just wield a saber as well as he can. In fact, you can match him blow for blow in battle. This in itself is a violation of Star Wars canon. This takes everything we've learned from Yoda and tosses it aside. And this is only in the first film of the Disney trilogy. Who, who allowed this to pass? Who allowed anyone to tell this story? Well, you know, everybody at Disney did. From the executives on high to the marketing people who didn't have a problem with any of that. I don't know why. Um, writing a character that is perfect with no flaws goes against drama. It goes against everything we know uh, uh, about great storytelling. I'm um, so I guess I would enter in Ray Palpatine herself as a. a and by the way, uh, speaking of canon violations, when exactly was Chief Palpatine around? Who who did he? Who was who was Ray's mother? Do we know this? Who bedded down with Sheev to create Ray? Is she a clone? What is she? Do we know? I don't know. I don't remember hearing about it. But to me, is she an immaculate conception? Is she supposed to be space Jesus? I don't know. Jar Jar. But these things are terrible. Maybe Jar Jar <laughs> was the father. That would explain a lot. I mean, Jar Jar might be the unsung hero of Star Wars or the evil, or the evil villain. But anyway, Your Honor, uh, that's what I have right now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Burnett. Your colleague, Mr. Steiner, has uh, uh, seemed to have fixed his internet issues. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Mr. Burnett. Um, people in the chat apparently love you, and uh, it's, uh, you're getting a lot of support. Uh, and and we're going to see. We haven't seen the defense case. Uh, Mr. Steiner, are you... Uh, prepared for your presentation. Unfortunately, because of your absence, most of your time was taken up uh, by Mr. Burnett. Um, you've got limited time. Please cut to the salient argument uh, for your for the prosecution side of your case. Oh, you're muted. Uh, you need to unmute your mic. Uh, it says your mic isn't connected. While you're fixing your technical issues, I'm going to uh, I'm going to go to our uh, our sketch artist, uh, Mr. Mr. Blackwood is. All right, I'm going to read some super chats while you solve your technical issues. We have a few here very quickly. Hulk Hogan's giant taint for five it says thanks for doing something different, <laughs> presenting how Disney imploded Star Wars. Thank you, Mr. Hulk Hogan's giant taint i object to hulk hogan's giant taint uh you you may object uh joey hamilton for two lucas himself brought back darth maul and joey hamilton says mr burnett one could argue lucas himself bungled canon since the beginning why does secret baby luke have the last name skywalker why does obi-wan keep kenobi why does leia remember her mother uh, sure. I, I could rebut that, Your Honor. Uh, yes, let's, um, Mr. Burnett, if you could rebut that uh, last comment. Uh, that's just what George Lucas wrote. Uh, he's not. He doesn't have to explain everything. I mean, why does Leia remember her mother? She's force sensitive. She imprinted on her. She imprinted a memory uh, on, on her that that never left. That's why she has images of her mother in her memory. And as for people keeping their same names. Well, if there's a bright center of the universe, Tat Tatooine is the planet that it's furthest from. No one would ever believe that anybody would even look out there. Unless, of course, you were a pod racer and you traveled to go to the Boonta Eve pod race all the time. Maybe you'd run into someone with the same name. But really, do pod racers run in the same circles as the Empire or Dark Lords of the Sith? I would say people just kept their own names because that's who they were. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's, that's keeping your identity. And as we know, Keeping your identity is oh so important these days. 
Let's uh, thank you, Mr. Burnett, for that rebut on the comment. Uh, Mr. Steiner, for the prosecution, you've got mere minutes now before we move to the defense. But uh, if you could just cut to the chase on the salient points of your argument, keeping your camera off may help with the uh, Internet. Mr. Steiner, you have the floor. Uh, Mr. Steiner, Mr. Steiner, uh, as put forth in the instructions that were emailed, you need to be prepared for court. Uh, I don't hear you. I don't see you. Um, we're going to have to move on to the defense. And uh, I'm sorry for that. Who on the defense would like to go first in their presentation? Uh, I can uh, go first, Your Honor. Uh, uh, our court sketch artist, Mr. Blackwood. Well, there you are. Uh, who, who can go first? Become the Knight, was that you? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. I'll just call you Mr. Knight, if you if you don't mind. That's fine. Um, that is a very smart shirt to wear to Thank a you. wine tasting. Um, so there you are. Uh, and the, the star of David Guitar in the back. It's kind of cool. Uh, that's actually, um, you talking about this guy here? Yeah. Uh, I, I put it more forward because it kind of looks Star Wars-y. Oh, yeah. You know? Like the Millennium Falcon, a TIE fighter, and a Stormtrooper had a baby. Looks kind of cool. I object relevance. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Uh, Mr. Knight, uh, we have now pivoted to the defense. The floor is yours. Combined, we've got 30 minutes for the defense until we go to open debate. Uh, please uh, proceed and remember to leave time for uh, Mr. Matt and uh, Mr. Chato. Absolutely. And uh, uh, WDW Pro has joined us. Um, is WDW Pro here uh, on part of the defense as a witness? Mr. Pro is reporting for duty as a witness for the defense, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pro. Or I could say WDW Pro. Um, please proceed, Mr. Knight, and uh, uh, thank you for your presence uh, in court today. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. May I share my screen with the stream? Because I have a, a slide presentation. Yes. Uh, let's go to uh, uh, if you there, you should see you should be presented at the very bottom of the screen with uh, with a series of options, and one should say present. There we go. Uh, there you go. Is, is that on stream now? Uh, it, it it is now yes uh please okay. proceed with your presentation sir uh thank you your honor uh ladies and gentlemen of the jury uh just to quickly go through some rebuttals to the charges um this is partially due to or this is partially addressing some of the initial charges that were um a part of the initial draft before it was rewritten as well uh, to the point that the force is female, uh, this never manifested itself in any substantial way in the movies. <clears throat> it may be ideological pandering through marketing and PR, but does not manifestly infringe on canon. I'd argue this should be applied to count four, malicious introduction of current day politics. Uh, the second point, uh, if people have said the force was reduced to superpowers, uh, by Disney, I would argue George Lucas allowed the Force to resemble superpowers during the prequels, featuring bloated, impossible lightsaber fights. He moved away from training and mysticism of the original trilogy and exchanged them for spectacle. Uh, the philosophy behind the Force was disregarded. Another uh, common complaint from people who want to see Disney uh, found guilty. Uh, George Lucas ruined the philosophy of the Force in the prequels through the introduction of metachlorians, making one's relationship to the Force scientific, not spiritual or mystical. George Lucas also altered the philosophy of the Force regarding light versus dark side. In Empire, you have the contrast of Yoda lifting the X-Wing on Dagobah versus Vader throwing debris at Luke on Cloud City when they finally face off. This was intended to be a direct contrast showing how the same force ability moves op moving objects is used differently by light and dark. To quote Yoda, a Jedi uses the force for knowledge and defense, never for attack. In Empire, Luke only fights Vader because he is ensnared by him while attempting to rescue his friends. In Jedi, Luke seeks out Vader to turn him to the light side peacefully. He only attacks Vader 
when we when it is revealed, he is giving in to the dark side. The idea that uh, light side valued knowledge and defense while dark side valued attack was blatantly dismantled in the prequels. Uh, now for my arguments. George Lucas fraudulently misused canon in his own universe. He killed Star Wars well before it ever made its way to Disney, and you can't kill what's already dead. Uh, George Lucas added plenty of canon that retroactively made action or lack of action by characters unwise or stupid. Uh, subsection 1. Force pool was added in Empire when Luke pulls his lightsaber from the snow in the Wampa Cave. That being the case, when the in the previous movie, in Episode 4, when the Millennium Falcon is parked, and you see here we have these two stormtroopers out here. Hey, can you give us a hand with this? They walk up, and the audience hears blaster fire. Blaster fire is very loud and is not as silent as using force pool to pull their guns out of their hands. Seems like, you know, that, that's a little bit cannon disruptive, but nothing too crazy. But it's not really a smart action given the cannon that was added in the next movie. Uh, we complain about Obi-Wan meeting Leia in the Disney Plus series. Why wouldn't Leia grate him differently in her message if they had ex an extended d adventure together? Uh, pardon me, I'm sorry. We forgot that George Lucas set this precedent of not remembering people, or remembering people they're not supposed to remember. In Jedi, Leia recounts remembering her mother, though Padme died moments after birth. Um, Anakin built C-3PO as a child to help his mother, and C-3PO serves Padme through the Clone Wars up until her death. Anakin should be intimately familiar with this droid, though he doesn't recognize him in Cloud City, as we see here before Han Solo is frozen in carbonite. In The Phantom Menace, uh, the first action scenes shows Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon escaping the droids using force speed. It's the only ability they have to get them out of trouble. This ability is extremely useful when, say, your master is in a one-on-one -on -one battle with a Sith, and he decides not to use it because of plot. Uh, point B. George Lucas altered established canon in the original trilogy. Even Disney has not had the gall to do that. George Lucas created the infamous Han shot first controversy. I assume we're all familiar with this for the sake of time. I can move past it, but we know this is a very egregious um, in violation in the eyes of the fans. Uh, the entirety of the special editions was an affront to Star Wars movie, front, affront to the Star Wars movies the fans grew up with for almost two decades, changing classic movies that defined a genre and redefined blockbusters in service of George's own ego. He then rubbed salt in the wombs of the fandom by removing the original theatrical releases from market, very literally attempting to erase history. Uh, George Lucas made the Star Wars Holiday Special <clears throat> immediately following the first Star Wars movie. <clears throat> I don't know that it really needs elaboration. It's a massive eyesore in the Star Wars canon. And as we can see here, a lot of my defense is a prosecution of George Lucas, which it will come full circle, I promise you. If we are going to prosecute George Lucas instead of Disney, it would be important to note that he admitted to conspiracy to tamper evidence, quote, if I had time and a hammer, I'd track down every bootleg copy of the Star Wars Holiday Special, and I would smash it. Uh, now to point two. We grant George some level of levity, correct? Because Star Wars is science fantasy. So there's some wiggle room for imagination in play. Canon can be convenient to serve the momentary plot, and let's not forget the rule of cool. Is it cool? Let's, let's, let's get our imaginations alive and jumping. Let's go wow. Uh, George added Force Pool in the Wampa Cave, and it was an exciting moment. It showed us how much Luke had grown in dramatic fashion and made us wonder what else the Force was capable of. And even the moment in the previous movie was served better by having only the blaster sound. You, you save on production costs by not having to write a whole scene. It snappily happens, and they walk out in the Stormtrooper outfits. You get enough in that small moment to understand what happened, and it moves the story along. Uh, and we forgive that. 
Uh, George never intended Luke and Leia to be siblings. In his original nine movie outlines, George had planned for Luke to seek out his sister, who was not Leia, in a later film. Leia was meant to be an isolated monarch, and Han was supposed to die in episode six. Due to the stress of making films and the strain it was putting on his marriage, he decided to wrap up the story in one trilogy. The easiest way to tie loose ends of Yoda's quote saying, uh, no, there is another Skywalker, and also the Han, Luke, and Leia love triangle, was to reveal Leia as Luke's sister. Revealing that Luke and Leia are siblings does make people wonder why they were kissing so much all the time. It's a little <laughs> weird if George intended that from the beginning. But we forgive it because we understand the realities and the logistics and stress of filmmaking. Even the greatest plans change when you're in production. Um, <clears throat> one of the greatest offenses that fans cite for canon is the Holdo maneuver. For those unfamiliar, um, Admiral Holdo takes a ship, turns on the hyperdrive, and flies through a capital ship, uh, annihilating a bunch of the fleet and the capital ship itself. Um, if using a hyperdrive to ram a capital ship is a viable tactic, why wouldn't the Rebellion use this against the Death Star? Why would any army build expensive, large, less maneuverable targets? These are all very fair questions. The Holdo maneuver creates more canon questions than it answers. But let's examine the Holdo maneuver in the context of the story. Admiral Holdo admonishes Poe for doing a risky, heroic act that won a skirmish. She intentionally withholds intel and, plan intel and plans from him for no reason other than resentment. And she complains about men. Uh, pardon the language, Your Honor, but in legal jargon, she is what we refer to as a bitchy feminist. <laughs> She's conceited, rude, and condescending. And I can't think of a better way of illustrating a level of character depth than watching her make the ultimate sacrifice to save the rebels while taking an extraordinarily risky, remo uh, risky maneuver, one like she criticized Poe for doing earlier in the film. At her heart, she also wanted to be a hero. When I first watched the Holdo maneuver in theaters, I thought it was insanely cool and dead serious. One of the coolest things I'd ever seen in Star Wars. After watching some reviews and reactions to the film, I understand why this creates problems for all the previous work. And lessening the cool factor substantially, I would say. But such a dramatic event emphasizing a revelation to the audience that she too is a reckless hero deep down was immediately effective. <clears throat> Conclusion, George Lucas set the president for ruining canon. Uh, George Lucas already demonstrated multiple times that he wasn't keeping close track of his own canon. He set the precedent for canon abuse and disregard for fandom. He had to make changes mid-trilogy to accommodate the pressures of making these films. He altered the hollowed original trilogy effectively, permanently, uh, 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 I don't know why I typed that, so sorry, and still to this day hasn't listened to fans about releasing the original cut. I'm certainly not saying Disney handled the Star Wars IP well, but George didn't either. For me and for a lot of fans, Star Wars died with the prequels. I remember when it was announced that Star Wars was buying Disney, the vast majority of fans were extremely excited. We'd seen how they developed the MCU to this point, and we're hoping Disney would resurrect Star Wars to its former glory of the original trilogy. And most of us walked away from Force Awakens feeling like Star Wars was back. Notice the phrase, Star Wars is back. We wouldn't have had this excitement for Disney taking the reins in 2012 if George hadn't killed Star Wars first. An entire documentary was created, which Your Honor featured in, called The People vs. George Lucas. It details how fans were offended by George's handling of this IP, including the canon. Disney may have failed to resurrect Star Wars, but they aren't responsible for killing it. George Lucas is. Uh, I yield the floor. Your Honor, I would like to object to my esteemed colleague's entire testimony, his entire <laughs> argument. We, George Lucas is not on trial here. Disney is on trial. He failed to address the actual case at hand, and I would have all of what he just said stricken from the record. Uh, Your Honor, if I may make my case, um, I think it's hard to say that Disney killed anything if George Lucas already killed it. Can but that's not what that's we're discussing here today. That's not what's on I, trial. That's, a, that's, a, that's what the entire trial is over, is the, the death of Star Wars. 
but that's not what we're arguing today. But I, I, I think, would like I think, to say that become the night looks like Paul Rudd. So that means all <laughs> all of his testimonies is admissible. <laughs> that's what I have to say. I think I think there's more than enough evidence in there to show that George, the guy who made the canon, also didn't pay that close attention, and that I think fans need to understand what level of um, not not grievance leniency they're willing to give and why. And I'm certainly not going to make an argument saying that Disney didn't abuse canon. I mean, I, I would argue that's almost indefensible. But I would have to say, um, if, if we're going to put blame on someone for ruining Star Wars, I think George did it first. I'm happy to rebut Judge every Gore, one of actually, my Judge esteemed Gore, colleagues. Judge Gore, you are muted. Judge Gore. I'll just say, know. excuse me, Mr. Burnett, Mr. Burnett, please. We will be getting to the, to the debate phase in a short period of time. I would like the defense to complete the presentation. We have Mr. Matt up That's next. That's fine with me. I just wanted to make my objections on the record. I, I, I appreciate that, Mr. Burnett. We will move to an open debate phase uh, it, very, very shortly. Uh, we have Mr. Matt is up next, and we have two witnesses who will be who will be testifying as well. Mr. Matt, I will put you front and center. You have the floor. And uh, and you may begin your presentation. You have uh, less than 15 minutes, so please, uh, you'll you'll need to move this along. Move along. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to call my first witness, Disney expert and YouTube host, WDW Pro. Uh, WDW Pro, do you do you uh, will you will you abide by the court? Would you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, George. I do. Okay, you're sworn in. Mr. You may Pro, proceed, you, Mr. Matt. You may proceed, Mr. Matt. Thank you, you are, thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate it. Mr. Pro, can you please tell us briefly who you are, what you do, and where your work can be found? My work can be found on the YouTube channel, WDW Pro, as well as on the website, www.thatparkplace.com, where I operate as an analyst of all things Disney and all things that should be fun. Happy to be here. Looking forward to uh, this questioning. Mr. Pro submitted written testimony answering the question, in your expert opinion, do you think there was any better organization other than the Walt Disney Company to take the Star Wars brand into the future? Mr. Pro, could you please read the court your statement? Well, I could. I suppose I'll have to pull that up. Do you want to go to another question while I pull that up? I will I will highlight a part of your statement. In your statement, you said Disney would seem to be a perfect fit for Star Wars, both in the present, past, and future. Um, it sounds like in your written statement, you don't do you have it up? Do you want to read it? I don't yet, but given our time constraints, perhaps it would be more... I can just read it uh, real quick. Yes, yes. Let's speed through this. Let's just do that. Mr. Pro submitted to the court his written statement. The Walt Disney Company is uniquely positioned to promote and facilitate the growth of the Star Wars franchise, leveraging a host of media delivery platforms as well as the best box office pipeline in the industry. The company's only real weaknesses is in terms of, one inability to produce video game content in-house, and two, potential and perceived inability of Lucasfilm to produce satisfying Star Wars content on a regular basis. In every other way, Disney would seem to be a perfect fit for Star Wars, both in the present, past, and future. Although the intellectual property is damaged, there is little doubt the stories of George Lucas could make tens of billions of dollars over the next decades. Also of note, Disney's relationship with third parties such as Hasbro and Electronic Arts should prove invaluable to continuing not only a passive media large growth future for Star Wars, but also a tremendous increases in merchandise and interactive media segments. So it sounds like you don't agree with a plaintiff, Mr. Pro, that the franchise is somehow dead or murdered. Dead, no. Murdered, no. Damaged, yes. You honestly believe in your expert opinion, given the current conditions, that Disney and only Disney 
has the best ability to produce Star Wars into the future. At this time, yes. That that could change in the next years, but as of the present, right now, where we all sit, that remains true. Last week, we heard the prosecution highlight moments of Disney CEO's Bob Iger's book, The Ride of a Lifetime, during his contract negotiations between George Lucas. Given the history of the Walt Disney Company and their relationship with outside auteur creators like George Lucas, did you expect Lucas to get everything he wanted in the Star Wars deal, retaining some aspect of, aspect of brand control? If not, please, I, brief, please explain. I never anticipate that anyone will receive the full, uh, the full benefit of everything they would wish to have in contractual negotiations. When someone does receive everything they're asking for in contractual negotiations, the other side has clearly screwed up. Did you think Bob Iger acted somehow maliciously when representing the Walt Disney Company in their effort to purchase Star Wars? No, not at that time. Your Honor, I have no more further questions for Mr. Pro. Thank you, Mr. Pro. I have no further questions at this time. Uh, I understand you have another witness. Is that true? That is correct, Your Honor. I'd like to call former network executive Paul Chato to the stand. Thank you. Mr. Chato, do you promise and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you, George? George, I do swear, yes, I do. <laughs> you may proceed Mr. Chido, can, you, can you please briefly tell us who you are, what you do, and where we can find your work? I am a former network executive up here in uh, Canada for the CBC. I was head of TV comedy, and I spent three years in Los Angeles uh, uh, researching um, comedy and how you Americans do it so well. Uh, and, and I met many expatriate uh, Cana uh, Canadians who were famous in, in Hollywood and, and uh, learned all the ins and outs of what the studio systems were uh, down there. I was even offered a job at Paramount as a VP of development, but I decided to do other things. Uh, so that's, that's my short history. Well, we're glad that you're here. You're the perfect witness for this case. Thank you for being here. Set in the fictional realm, the Star Wars franchise is almost 50 years old. The plaintiffs contend that legacy characters are somehow sacrosanct, and even over decades, the primary cast of heroes must remain static, with story centering on the same handful of actors. Mr. Chato, I'd like to show you a few exhibits using some other major American franchises as a demonstration of how that sentiment doesn't match reality and get your reaction to these next items. I'd like, we'd like to see exhibit B, please. Is that possible? Uh, you will need to share screen yourself, Mr. Matt. So um, you bring it up on your browser and another win in, a, in another tab and there is an option at the very bottom. It says present. You'll be able to present uh, whatever it is you're about to show us. And, and Your Honor, I'd just like to point out, I do have 100,000 subscribers. So I just want to point that out. Uh, yes. A, Objection um, relevance. <laughs> <laughs> hearsay. A, it, it means I'm a big mocker. Uh, That's what the, it means. No, it's not that. hearsay. He has the evidence behind him over his shoulder. You can see the 100,000 subscriber plaque. <laughs> it means I'm a major macher in the business. I'd like to remind the court that Mr. Chato is Canadian, and that his 100,000 subscribers only translates to 83,000 subscribers. <laughs> ooh, ooh. <laughs> Mr. Ring. Uh, my connection is Mr. Ring. Uh, I, 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 we're looking only for funny jokes in courts. Um, so I, I apologize, Your Honor. <laughs> uh, Mr. Matt, have you have you found a way to present your, your Honor, screen? Right, your Honor, my uh, my connection as we live stream, I can't pull up my Google documents with the exhibits. Uh, the producer has them. Maybe he could share his screen. Um, uh, this is Mr. Brown. Me. Mr. Brown, are you able to assist with Mr. Matt? Um, if you put the Link to the documents into the private chat. Mr. Brown, Exhibit B, working please. tirelessly. Uh, just in the private chat, Mr. Matt, you put, put the link to the documents. Mr. Brown will right. share screen. We'll go from there. And then you can just scroll down that document. 
Uh, Mr. Brown working tirelessly on the court uh, from behind the scenes. Uh, and there you go. Did you did you did you put in the private chat the link? My to the... bandwidth is being. There All right, go. you'll have to you'll have to wrap up your you'll have to wrap up in five minutes your presentation. But perhaps you can describe for us some of this. And and what we'll do is we will put your link to the Google Docs with your evidence of all your presentations, including Come the Night. We'll put the, the links to those presentations in the description of this episode, along with, if you're interested, we have all of the counts and charges. So in this episode, it's, it's not there now, folks, uh, members of the jury, but it will be in the description for this episode, all of the links to the Google Docs with the defense, and the prosecution and the charges themselves, you will be able to examine them. So thank you, thank you, Mr. Knight, for that. Uh, well, proceed, I can't Mr. get to Matt. my Google documents. This is the stream. All right, I gotta, so if you look at this, if you look at this X-Men comic book, you see that uh, this came out in 1963. It has all the original legacy characters of the X-Men Beast, Jean Grey, Cyclops, Iceman. And then on this X-Men, 20 years later, franchises we were talking about, totally different team. And my question to Mr. Chato was, is you see that Stan Lee knew that the characters in, in, uh, in Marvel had to evolve. Um, what do you think that evolution in the uncanny X-Men tells us about legacy characters? Well, I think it's important to mention that no one purposely makes bad product. And in the case of the comic books, they knew to continue the interest in the comic books is that they had to add new characters. You couldn't just maintain legacy characters. Um. Your Honor, not being able to show my exhibits really just uh, really just blows my my uh, my presentation actually. So could, my bandwidth could, is too limited. You, I can't well, get could, to my Google Doc. Could, could you send them to me and I can share my screen? Would that be okay? If I yeah, could, just, if I could get to my Google the, Doc, Mr. Matt, put the link to the Google Docs yeah. in the private chat, yeah. so we can all get. I the, cannot the link. bring up my. Very I cannot bring up Google. Just cut and paste. Uh, I'm sorry. It's, I, so, I, okay, it's, it's not fine, letting it's me do it. I think become yeah. the knight oh. added the link. No, no, that that's oh, he a, does. That's, it? Mr. that's Mr. Knight's uh, presentation. No, oh. yeah, that that's for the description of the show after we're done. Oh. Uh, it's my 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 system is not acting up. It's acting up. I can't really uh. I can't really access it. I'm having too much technical difficulty. I'm so sorry. Well, you're gonna you're gonna have back to after the break. And maybe try to... uh, you're gonna have to proceed with your argument, let your oral argument here, and uh, and if you could just continue. All right. Let's let's cut to the end here. I, I can't use exhibits. Your Honor, ladies okay. and gentlemen of the jury, um, we heard that somehow. Lucasfilm president, Star Wars brand manager, Kathleen Kennedy declared the force as female. Mr. Chato, did you ever see Miss Kennedy make such a declaration in the media, ever catch an interview or video clip of this accusation in any form? No. When you viewed the Disney sequel trilogy, did you notice anything in the new film specifically about the feminization of the fictional power of the force? I did not. I would like to address the notorious force as female image portrayed somehow as related to star wars take a close look at the forces female t-shirts it's no word star wars no star wars style font basically a generic block lettering in all caps the photograph that you know as kathleen kennedy wearing the forces female t-shirt was taken at the annual archer film festival supporting female high school filmmakers in beverly hills california in may 2017 the event had nothing to do with Star Wars. It had nothing to do with the Walt Disney Company, but it has a connection to the corporation Nike. In the spring of 2017, Nike launched a marketing campaign aimed at young women called The Forces Female to support their popular athletic shoe known as Air Force One. 
Miss Kennedy was unable to appear today. One of my exhibits was a video where an interviewer asked Miss Kennedy, did you know that you created such a controversy wearing the forces female t-shirts? She said, when I showed up at my daughter's school, everyone was already wearing the forces female t-shirts because the corporation Nike handed them out. That's what she said. Then the interviewer in my last exhibit, I've, I had one more exhibit to show you where Kathleen Kennedy on video explains her philosophy about the force. Um, in this video, she's asked, do you think the force is female? She says, no, I don't think the force is for f women. I don't think the force is for men. The force is a ubiquitous power. And therefore, I wasn't even aware that I made the controversy that I did when we wore the Nike t-shirts the force is female. Unfortunately, I had clips to play you. I can't show you that. Um, so, Mr. Chato, I just you, I have you here. I'm very sorry that, that we had some problems. Now that you're aware of these facts, that the force is female t-shirt is for a Nike shoe, that Kathleen Kennedy was asked directly on camera, do you think that the force is female? And she said, no, it's really for everybody. Mr. Chato, what do you think now of the plaintiffs using this photo out of context to mislead the public, essentially? I think it has been used incorrectly to tar and feather a very talented Hollywood executive with a fantastic track record. <laughs> with the new evidence presented, with your expertise as a former network executive, I think it's safe to say now that Kathleen Kennedy did not declare the forces female and has been herself a victim of false misleading claims by a group of angry fans stuck in the past, unwilling to confront reality. Finally, taking all this into account, Mr. Chato, in your expert opinion, do you think Star Wars franchise was somehow murdered, damaged beyond, beyond repair? Absolutely not. Uh, the myth of Star Wars is still very strong. Uh, as uh, the knight said, George did his own damaging himself. Uh, we all love Jar Jar Binks. Um, uh, there's so many aspects to the first three. Not that I mean. Let me ask Star you about Canon real quick three. before we go. We, um, you know, Mr. Burnett mentioned how sick sacrosanct can Canon is. We all enjoy Mr. Burnett's commentary about Star Wars and every other things. But let me ask you about Canon. When it comes to Canon. Isn't it a case of a grieved fandom wanting to have their cake and eat it too? Which George Lucas canon is acceptable? Which George Lucas canon is mocked and rejected by the Star Wars cool kids? Ewoks, Jar Jar Binks, the holiday special. Mr. Chato, is all canon tr truly on the same playing field, deserving to populate comic books, video games, and cinematic feature films equally? Well, it's, I think it's true that George Lucas made up canon on the fly as he needed it. And to expect that Disney isn't going to be doing the same thing, I think, is uh, a fallacy. Uh, I personally know about the holiday special because the director of our comedy show, The Frantics, Four on the Floor, was selected by George Lucas himself to direct the holiday special. And that turned into a complete fiasco because of George's involvement. So, so George, George was inconsistent in his shepherding and nurturing of his own brand. He wasn't a superhero. So there Correct. was productions was not, that became. He, George did not have magical capabilities to, to the best of my knowledge. He's an imperfect human being like us all and he's fallible. And we've seen that uh, not all canon is created equally. Is that true, Mr. Chato? Correct. And it looks like he dresses from the Salvation Army. <laughs> I, um, I, I, I could continue. I have one more thing. In, in the Force Awakens, Disney Star Wars Episode 7, it rests at number 11 for all time total gross at the box office adjusted for 2022 ticket prices. It beat five out of six George Lucas produced feature films, including fan favorite Empire Strikes Back. Episode eight, The Last Jedi charts at 44 in between Home Alone, an animated Disney classic, Pinocchio, 
but legacy character actor Carrie Fisher had suddenly died before the film was finished. Mr. Chato, this tragedy had to impact the quality of story regarding the arc of legacy characters and might have contributed to a sense of disappointment, removing an essential link like Princess Leia Organa mid-production of a trilogy of new films without warning. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, uh, I would. As an executive, this would have been a crushing blow to be able to maintain the momentum of the franchise. Carrie Fisher was a very important component uh, of the Star Wars franchise, and to see her go that way was not Disney's fault, un unless they arranged to kill her. Then, but then I, I then, can't talk. About it. And then, as soon as she died, their plans had to have radically changed, and they were not allowed to finish with the story that they intended. Don't you agree? Absolutely. The movie went through radical changes just to accommodate the fact that Carrie was no longer available. Which is I would not like to, Disney's Your fault. Honor, I have one more point. I'd like to go over Harrison Ford real quick. Harrison. Ford was seen on Jimmy Kimmel eight years ago, gleefully declaring that behind the scenes he lobbied to kill Han Solo and had been doing so for 30 years. If fans are upset that Han Solo was killed in The Force Awakens, maybe they should direct their anger at the influential actor who wanted his legacy character dead for decades. Let's be honest, Mr. Chato, crotchety Harrison Ford did not look forward to the new gig, but he took the money anyway. Is that correct? That is correct. It should be noted for the record that in my exhibit, Mr. Ford is gleefully taking credit for the demise of Han Solo on a late night talk show in front of a national audience. Your Honor, I, let's, I, let's, I let's, let's, Mr. Matt, if you could if you could bring it home and complete your presentation. I would I would like to say that if you look through the evidence that I presented that I will put up in a link, the the force is female is a Nike Corporation spring of 2017 advertising campaign. We have been lied to for four straight years about how this has anything to do with Star Wars or the Walt Disney Company or Kathleen Kennedy. The Force is Female is a Nike ad campaign. So I would, I would, I would submit to you that in that video, she's asked, what is Kathleen Kennedy's philosophy of the Force? The force is not female, according to Kathleen Kennedy. I rest my case. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Matt, uh, for you. Uh, moving forth in spite of some technical difficulties. I'll say this when it comes to the preparation of documents. And look, while we take the proceedings in court seriously, this is the first time something of this nature has ever been done. So we are going to have some technical issues. I want to compliment Mr. Knight on the preparation of his documents. Uh, Mr. Ozark, I did find uh, the documents you sent me. They weren't really appropriate to display on screen. There were a list of links. Um, I think to prepare that in the future, uh, what you should do is share it so that it's shareable, not editable, shareable. So anyone with the link can view it, but not everyone with the link can edit it. Okay. Second thing is, if you have a if you have a link to a video, just embed the video. If you have photos, embed the photos. That way, as we're scrolling through the document, we'll be able to see the photos and see the picture. So what what you prepared was a very good list of um, of of evidence, but it's not presented in a way that we could have shown it on screen. So I want to compliment you on your research, and I would like to share it. It'll be shared in the in the uh, link to the description in this episode. I, I promise we're going to put up all the links. And uh, Mr. Knight kind of set the standard. Mr. Mr. Matt, we'll have you back on, on a future session in court. Thank you. I want to, uh, and, and I, I want to thank everyone here for taking all of this very seriously. I want to thank you, uh, members of the jury. We have 1,069 people watching us live. Um, Mr. Ring, if, how many people 69, are watching? 69, Your Honor. Nice. 69. Oh, now it's 1,070. Somebody just joined. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to check Screw in with guy. Mr. Blackwood. Mr. Blackwood has been tirelessly uh, drawing on screen. I see, um, I see. Uh, I believe that's Mr. Chato, among others. I thought that was Joe uh, Biden. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Don't say that. Uh, perhaps sorry, there's man. some. Well, there you go. There's uh, Mr. Knight. Um, perhaps will there are other some Star Wars inspired photos, uh, drawings in there as well. Again, follow Mr. Blackwood at uh, Blackwood. Uh, 
we have his information. It's in I, in the description of this episode. I think um, I think that's me. Well, there, there you go. <laughs> uh, we will have a brief recess of a couple of minutes if you'd like to uh, use the facilities. And if you would like to grab a, a delicious beverage, please take the di time to do so. Jury, uh, please do not leave. You are going to see some videos that may relate to things that we've been discussing here today. So please stick around for the second half. Open debate is coming. Uh, I, and I will, when we come back from that, I will be reading your super chats to kick things off. And we'll be throwing other questions on screen. So get ready for the second half of Critics Court Star Wars on trial. Here we go, folks. Because I feel like Star Wars is, is very, like, patriarchal and clothes make the man toxic. Yes, yes. Just because you're a stormtrooper in the Empire doesn't mean you can't look fabulous. The first order of business must be uniform. And uniform doesn't mean it all needs to look the same. Accessorize. Long live the matriarchy. Follow these Disney Star Wars story commandments. Thou shalt ignore logic and canon for whimsy and convenience. french fries and coca-cola imagine how much fun your kids will have i did research to try to distill everything down into motifs that would be universal. I attribute most of the success to the psychological underpinnings, which have been around for thousands of years, and the people still react the same way to the stories as they always have. So what lessons do you think they're taking away from watching Star Wars in, in Italy and Malaysia and South America? The average human being has much more awareness of the other cultures that exist, coexist with them on this planet and that certain things um, go across cultures uh, and uh, entertainment is one of them and uh, film uh, and the stories that I tell cut across all cultures are seen all around the world. Court is now back in session. We've returned from our recess. Uh, so we will continue with uh, our now open debate. Before we do that, I'll be reading some uh, some super chat questions and comments that have come in. Uh, and 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 I also want to I also want to let people know that there will be a ch a poll now during this where you can you can vote whether you think the defense or the prosecution is doing a better job. That poll will be up there momentarily. Thank you, Ms. P. Coffey, for adding the poll. And thank you to the mods out there, Lord Thoth. Will there be rebuttal to um, the defense's uh, presentation? 100%, Mr. Oh, Burnett. You do. will be able to, to rebut. I want to get through these uh, super chats 
quickly and we're moving to open debate and rebuttal of arguments. Here we go. Uh, Bush and Ryu Cat for five. Your Honor, if the prosecution wins, will you consider part of the fine to release the Phantom Menace 3D edition for home so I can trash TFA 3D copy? That is not up to me, but thank you for your support of the channel. Nerd Genix for $4.99. Canon violations. Number one, Sidious's unexplained return. Number two, retconning Anakin's redemption and identity as the chosen one. Number three, Ray Skywalker, in quotes. Number four, Force Heal. Uh, Max maketh for four ninety nine in the Legends book Kenobi. It is explained that Kenobi is a very common surname. I did not know that. Uh, as a serious man, for five, as in the court of the Queen of Hearts, we really should have begun with <laughs> sentencing. Well, there you are. Nice reference. Matuine for ten. Obi Wan Kenobi. Obi Wan. That's a name I've not heard in a long time. Oh, except when a nine-year-old girl, Reva, and Darth Vader called me by that about 10 years ago. That's a quote. Disney did that, not Lucas. Um, thank you for your support of the channel. Dr. Fauci's prison butt. Uh, for 10, Disney changed the Skywalker saga into the Palpatine saga. All the Skywalkers are dead. Ray Palpatine kills the Emperor as Sith do. And now a Palpatine will create the new Jedi Order, not a Skywalker. 200 Watt Studio for two. Why no cross-examination of witnesses? Yeah, why uh, not? That is, that is going to happen now. That will happen now in the open debate. We Look, while we take the proceedings in court very seriously, we are making this up. This is a very serious fake YouTube court trial. I, I'm just reminding everyone. Yes. Please no laughing and please do not mock Dr. Fauci's prison, but thank uh, you for the wrong. He's been a long time viewer. I assume it's a he, but it's a long time viewer of the film threat live stream. And thank we, thank I'm you for the wrong to honor Dr. Fauci's prison, but thank you for the reminder, Mr. Ng. Matt Tuing goes on for five objection. Mike Zero has 289,000K subscribers. Just kidding. Paul, love ya. <laughs> 200 watt studio for five says guys this is not an act chato really believes what he's saying that is up to mr chato who can express himself freely and i assume will be cross-examined uh michael collier for 499 can someone discuss the erasure of the expanded universe and the amount of money and time the fans invested in the expanded universe mr collier that it will be addressed in a future charge the link to all the counts against uh disney lucasfilm are in the description of this episode that is I, a i believe i began my presentation with that your honor yes yes polysemia for five pounds and a member thank you for that we all knew that the trilogy would focus on new characters the lack of respect for the legacy characters and their arcs is what we found unforgivable joey hamilton for five mr burnett you've been on record defending kathleen kennedy's force is female shirt you concede this accusation was misinformation. The yes, I, I concede it was misinformation. I do not concede certain other things, which I will get to in my rebuttal. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Burnett. Uh, Mr. A very, very generous Scott Ski, zero two for 50. Canon violation How can Holdo's hyperspace ram possibly be the first time it was used when hyperdrives have existed? for millennia uh for for f's sake airplanes were barely 40 years old when people started ramming them into ships as am a I tactic to, am i allowed to briefly address that uh, uh sure you may address it so briefly. it depends upon whether or not we are using canon outside of movies or not if we're using canon not outside of movies then i don't think we should bring the eu into any of this discussion if we are then the hyperspace ram is not the first time it was used uh, during the Holdo maneuver. It actually was used during the uh, High Republic series. That's a book series that just came out a few years ago. I would also like to add, this is a very confusing question because Canon is also the brand of a camera manufacturer. So we have no idea what this person is talking about. <laughs> okay, Mr. Chato. Um, spe special Ray for four ninety nine. The Nike thing is a misdirect. Do you think KK, meaning Kathleen Kennedy, is so dumb she didn't realize the message that was sent 
Every new protagonist is female. Mic drop. Thank you for that. Anime Mike 365 for $9.99. Your, uh, your owner. I think you mean your honor. I believe the defense is correct. My evidence is if you look at stories throughout history, canon has been changed many times. And uh, we have some more. I'm going to save it for we will take a break in the middle. Um, it, we are now, we've now moved on to open debate. Uh, you, you, this is now open. I will, I will come in to referee this at times if it gets a little heated, but you may begin and, and Mr. Burnett, you, you were chopping at the bit to get started. Why don't you kick things off? Just a few things, uh, that I wrote down uh, regarding the force pull that is shown in the beginning of the empire strikes back. And why wasn't something like that used in star Wars on the death star? Well, Luke had been using the force for mere days. In Star Wars, he wasn't even that was, aware that, that was Obi Wan on the Millennium Falcon. Obi Wan has been seen to leap in crazy lava pits and swing his lightsaber super quick. You know, he's done incredibly awesome stuff. He was there on the Millennium Falcon. Well, we don't know where. We don't know if he was in if he was in uh, striking distance. Maybe they kept him uh, back so he wouldn't be discovered. He was you, the most important do, person do you on think the ship. It's a, do you think it's a smart idea to have a Jedi Knight be the one being protected during combat? Well, this wasn't the issue. This wasn't what you brought up. You brought up Luke Skywalker specifically in the force pull, and you used the force pull of the lightsaber in the Wampa Cave as your example. You didn't bring up Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'm addressing what you said about the force pull and Luke. And the thing is, Luke didn't know how to do a force pull, and by Empire Strikes Back, he did. That's, that's uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that saying. Luke didn't know how to do a force pull. I'm saying that force pull wasn't a part of canon, and George made it up because it was cool for the Empire Strikes Back, which is great. Right. It's fabulous. I don't think I don't think he made it up at all. I think we hadn't seen we hadn't seen any, uh, hardly any of the Jedi's powers or any of the Force powers at all until we get to really Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, let, always. That's it. I mean, yeah, Mr. Burnett, let me ask you a question. Uh, did George Lucas have the right to tweak, alter, disregard, and contradict his own source material? Particularly this point, I bring it up at this point because not a whole lot had been established about the Force. I don't know what kind of canon was established in A New Hope. To, very, very. To, to I, I imagine, that. I imagine it was intentionally vague in order to probe people's imaginations. They, he wanted to keep it vague. Well, I mean, it takes place in a few days. I mean, that's like asking a, a chemist everything he knows about chemistry and demonstrating it in 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 a, f a few days a few minutes of, of time i mean the force you, you you i mean how long does it take a samurai to learn how to wield a sword in all the different ways that he can wield a sword i mean the, we never sat down and no one went to jedi school in these movies you know we saw the jedi academy or younglings being trained but no one ever took us through the years it would take to become a jedi from the time you were a small child to the time you were enough to, until you could become a Padawan took years. So the idea that we're supposed to have seen every moment or everything that a Jedi could do in the space of a, of, of, of a, of a movie is absurd. Uh, absurd. Yes, the, the, to, the point, the point, point is, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Mr. Yeah, I, to my point is, you know, <clears throat> the, the star Wars canon was always a work in progress from day one. Yeah. And that it had not completely been established. Of I course. mean, I think the majority of it had been laid down and established by the time uh, Revenge of the Sith came out. Uh, so to say that, you know, to say that George violated his own canon uh, with the Force pull uh, in Empire Strikes Back just shows that, you know, George didn't even know that there was going to be uh, six six movies. He just made yeah, Star Wars. You know, fully, he had an idea, agree. not a foundation. But in Empire Strikes Back, that was his... Uh, that was his green light to say, okay, I can now legitimately expand on this universe. And so, of course, there's going to be contradictions. Of course, there's going to be tweaking that has to be done. Um, of course, I think a, a <laughs> huge part. Uh, I think a huge part of the fact that we have so many contradictions is the fact that um, Darth Vader says in the first movie, the ability to destroy a planet is insignificant next to the power of the Force. It right. is definitively superpowers that you can willfully tap into at any time, as long as you know how to be spiritual mystical right. man but, or but my mental point, leader. Right. My point is, who is the sole guardian of canon from episodes, uh, from films, yeah, episodes one through six? I'm going to say that's George Lucas. And I think the main point here is that this is George Lucas's 
story, you know, and, and for people to, you know, for people to kind of question him, you know, yeah, he made mistakes. He contradicted himself. But over time, he was solidifying ultimately what his vision for the Force and for what the Star Wars universe would be. And I think our point here is that Disney had now come in and dismantled everything George had, had built to that point. Well, I'd also like to point out that The Empire Strikes Back was written by Lawrence Kasdan mostly and also Lee Brackett based on a story by George Lucas. So he, that's fair. even from The Empire Strikes Back, George Lucas allowed other people to write films. Even the prequel trilogy had other writers that he wrote with. So, you know, I would say that in terms of canon violation, here's the thing. I mean, I'll give you an example from another franchise. Uh, in Star Trek, for instance, in the first season of Star Trek, we don't really know that there's a United Federation of Planets. You know that there's the United Earth Space Probe Agency. We learn about the Federation later. And I would say, well, that's because there was really no reason or no instance in the stories that were being told in the first season of Star Trek to maybe mention the Federation. It would be like everybody knows the White House is there. Everybody knows the U.S. government is there, but they don't mention it every single conversation they have. So... The idea that you're supposed to know all canon based on what you see in it. These movies are just a snippet. One of the great things about Star Wars is you know that there's a whole gigantic universe going about its business. And we're only seeing one small story in the entire Star Wars universe. So the idea that it was ever supposed to encompass everything you needed to know about anything in the Star Wars universe is sort of silly. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm definitely not saying that. Obviously, storytelling needs to be piecemeal. Obviously, you want to leave some element of surprise to, to the audience to engage with as they go forth on the story as you write it. Um, I think a, a big problem here, like I was saying, the canon problems are bound to happen when you have too much power or too much potential power at your disposal. And uh, it falls kind of similarly into the Dragon Ball Z problem. Um, after Goku defeats... I don't know if anyone here on this panel understands this reference or not. But after Goku defeats Frieza, the, the strongest being in the universe, the saga still continues, and there's always a stronger being in the universe, and strong next strongest being in the universe. It creates a lack of surprise, and it's like, okay, well, how powerful is Goku? How can he possibly have any challenge he's not going to overcome? I think the same thing goes for the Force. Eventually you're going to run into a problem where if you can just collapse a planet with your fist, um, your, your characters are too powerful to the point where they can't have a challenge, and you, you're going to start having um, lo logical problems when you have a deus ex machina, essentially, is, is what I'm trying to say. The Force kind of acts as a deus ex machina. I have a question for Mr. Machina. Burnett. When... Yes, sir. Mr. Burnett, um... I really admire your extensive knowledge about all things Star Wars and Star Trek. I've been a subscriber for your channel for probably three years. I, I have to ask you. Does that, you does read... that, uh, I, wait, I'm sorry. I, I thank you for that. But does that mean that you should be disqualified from participating? Just... Well, if we're going to go <laughs> head to head, I don't think so. Okay. Well, I think no, that's I... called uh, sucking up, Robert. <laughs> Everyone in the audience should subscribe to Robert Meyer Burnett's YouTube channel if you have not and read it, if you like long form discussion. Anyway, Mr. Thank Burnett, you. have you ever read I really want the Empire? Chatter, chatter. Oh, yes, Timothy Zahn trilogy. Yes. Have you noticed in Heir to the Empire, which fans will speak at length, they get really excited about Heir to the Empire. I I know that you might have noticed this. Have you noticed similarities in certain characters in Heir to the Empire that that reflect almost derivative characters from the original Marvel comic book run of the 70s? Did you ever notice anything like oh, that? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I think, as a matter of fact, look, I'm still waiting for the hoojibs to show up in the Star Wars universe because I have a know, cassette and, tape. I have a cassette tape of the Hoojibs. We can play that and, later. And Jackson, you know, I'm waiting for right. Jackson. I mean, you can get a, a yeah. Star Wars black figure now of Jackson. So no, I think I think that there was look, even the, the Kyber crystals were originally introduced in Splinter of the Mind's Eye. I was that was you my know, next that, question. Yeah. yeah. And so and you know Splinter of the Mind's Eye was something that was going to be made if Star Wars didn't make a lot of money. They could do do a sequel on the cheap. That was the origins of that story. Uh, Luke's, uh, George Lucas did write drafts of um, 
empire, but that's why based on the story by, you know, if you were in a writer's guild strike now, they would have gone to arbitration and Lee Brackett and mostly Lawrence Kasdan would have been, I think, prevailed as the writers of the, of, of, of the film. But yes, I think that there was a lot of, of Star Wars material that people drew from the Han Solo trilogy that Brian Daly wrote, like Han Solo at Star's End, um, and the Lando Calrissian books, Lando Calrissian and the Flo- Flame Wind of Oceon, or Lando Calrissian and the, uh, 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 let's say I can't remember any of the other titles, but those books. Um, oh, L- Lando Calrissian and the Mind Harp of Sharu. There was another one, um, but I yes, like I think highlight, the- you're a perfect person. Though to kind of rebut the rebuttal, if I may, that have you ever heard of the character Dash Rendar? Yes, Dash Rendar was the star of Shadows of the Empire. Total badass. You familiar with the vehicle that Dash Rendar flies? Yes, the he yes the it was a Carillion derivation. Um, Substantially less cool Millennium. Does it look like something that we're familiar with in the Star Wars universe? It has a Millennium Falcon quality to it, I would say. So you would agree in a sense that there are beloved characters that a hardcore demographic of fans really love. But when you take a look back, they might be slight derivatives. For example, Dash Rendar looks a lot like Han Solo, except he's from a wealthy family. Right. I just like your impression here. Well, no, I think you're you're absolutely right. But if you're working there, there are certain archetypes in any story. You know, when I would say that that in Star Wars, bounty hunters, smugglers, droids, they, that's part of the universe. I mean, just like truck drivers, military veterans of foreign wars and and um, uh, people like that or, or construction workers are ubiquitous in our in our in our culture. So I would say that there's probably a lot more smugglers out there in in the universe, especially when there's an empire that uh, commerce would have to get done. And what what better way than than smugglers? I mean, Han Solo. There's there's more than even one job. There's more than one hut out there running criminal empires. So they would need smugglers. Would be I, I think a very uh, great way to make money in this in the Star Wars universe. Make uh, wealth. So that it doesn't surprise me. And souped up Carillion freighters, just like you know people who like American muscle cars, turn to things like Mustangs or cougars or whatever they wanted to to turn into cars so there's there's certain there's certain shipyards that would make the Kuat shipyards are probably something that that would would manufacture a lot of these things i so, just want to i just want to add that i want i read the entire nancy drew star wars series and i only <laughs> mention that because i'm jealous of everyone's knowledge <laughs> Uh, really, I am but a humble defense uh, defense witness, but I would be remiss to not mention that we are seeing this continued pattern, this cycle, in that we have multiple sources now reporting that uh, heir to the Empire will be returning in name only, that uh, that potentially is the next name of Dave Filoni's movie that will be the uh, culmination of the Mandoverse. And so that will be uh, something that returns yet is uh, retrofitted now to fit Filoni's vision for what that should be, if that is indeed the real title of that movie. And that won't cause confusion at all. Nay, not uh, a bit. I, I, yeah. I, I, I do, there are a couple relevant chat comments that I want to get to uh, really quick. Joey Hamilton for two says, happy belated 35th birthday, Robert Meyer Burnett. <laughs> well, thank and, you. Uh, yes, my birthday was on Monday. 35, though. You, you flatter me, sir. Happy birthday, uh, Mr. Burnett. Uh, 200 Watt Studio for two says Robert Meyer Burnett knows his stuff. But uh, Mr. Rubio has a comment here. Kevin Rubio, some of you may know, is the director of Troops, uh, has also been involved uh, in many Lucasfilm projects. So we appreciate his attendance as part of the jury. Kevin Rubio for 10 says the force is female. The quote daughter from the more. Oh, wait, let me go back to that. What happened to that? I was in the middle of reading that. What happened? Did you? I don't know. Uh, did someone unstar? Can you can you bring up uh, Mr. Rubio's comment again? I was in the middle of reading it. I wasn't done. Um, okay. High Republic is post George Lucas, so your argument fails. L- let's try to find that um, Kevin Rubio comment from earlier. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Relevant. Did someone unstar it on accident while I was in the middle of reading it? 
Uh, and happy birthday, uh, Laser Bob, Cardinal Sin for Buck ninety nine. Is that someone that you know a reference, Mister Burnett? Uh, when I I was a laser disc retailer in the eighties at Seattle Silver Platters, uh, it was a store chain. I was the manager. I was the laser disc manager and buyer. They called me Laser Bob, and I had a my name tag said Laser Bob on it. Well, One there you are. Days. Laser discs from a bygone era. And I still own some laser discs. I, I, I like my laser dicks. Oh, well, <laughs> there we go. That's what uh, she said. Mr. Rubio, let me let me repeat this uh, comment here. Uh, the Force is female. The, da quote, daughter from the Mortis trilogy was the only one of the Trinity to survive in the form of an owl. The episodes were supervised by George Lucas. So, canon. Deal says uh kevin rubio kevin rubio may turn up um in this trial later in this trial we have some shocking guests that will be appearing in future editions of critics court and kevin uh i've spoken to kevin and and he he will be appearing on a future episode as well as people i'm sure that the jury will both love and revile it's going to uh, get interesting Chris, thank I you would kevin just... I want to point out with that, um, the forces female, I'm a staunch supporter of Kathleen Kennedy. Um, literally, she is one of the most successful producers in Hollywood. She's worked with some of the greatest filmmakers in Hollywood. And her abilities are, as all great producers do, they facilitate what the directors need to achieve their vision. And I would say that Kathleen Kennedy, beginning a full producer credit on E.T., Spielberg has said she's one of the best producers he ever worked with great producers are there to um provide what a director needs sometimes depending they can offer creative input and all that but great producers work in tandem with people and that said when she put on that shirt at her daughter's event that said the force is female i don't think she probably thought much of it since that was what was happening at the school at the time however I would say that the character of Princess Leia in Star Wars was always a strong character from the very beginning. She's the first, uh, other than R2 and 3PO, the first character we even see in Star Wars. We see her secret away the plans to the Death Star in R2-D2. We see her stand up to Lord Vader. We see her lie to Palpatine, I mean, to Tarkin and Vader on the Death Star after she's been imprisoned and tortured when the rescue attempt is about to go south from getting her out of the prison block she takes control and gets them into the garbage chute and arguably is responsible for getting everybody the falcon and off the death star and then she comes back and she presides over her forces attacking the death star so from the very beginning star wars had a very strong female presence in tandem with great male characters luke han luke a farm boy essentially two blue collar guys luke a farmer i mean pulling water out of a desert planet's air and then you had han solo who's a truck driver and ben kenobi a veteran of foreign wars so they had to work in tandem together the men and the women giving everything that they needed to make something work whereas the new star wars trilogy from disney put a, a woman front and center and constantly compromised the male characters and that was something that the original star wars trilogy did not do uh, a, a qu question for you mr burnett from our jury joey hamilton for two says mr burnett is manuel manny both hans canon well that's something only kevin rubio can speak to um for those of you who need to know what that is, uh, when Mon Mothma says in Return of the Jedi, Manny Bothans died bringing us this information. Many people think that Bothans, Bothans were some kind of an alien race. What people didn't know was that Mon Mothma was referring to her lover, Manuel Bothans, and it was a man. And Kevin Rubio brought this to light in his Tag and Bink series that was done for Dark Horse and later republished by Marvel. So Man in my Manuel mind, was Manuel was her pool boy, and uh, very possibly. But I would like to say that Manuel Bothans is indeed canon. 
And um, please don't read into anything into the both ends, both ends um, uh, <laughs> name. I, 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 anyone that would do that has a perverse mind. Uh, in any case, uh, let us let's let's continue. Uh, we're continuing with our open debate, and uh, I'm going to highlight yeah. Mr. Blackwood here just for a moment so we can see some of the sketches that he's working on. But please continue, gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, actually, I'd like to. Uh... Ask Mr. Burnett a question, but uh, the question is, uh, Mr. Knight's uh, argument was that George Lucas basically killed Star Wars, that he delivered in 2012 to Disney a dead franchise. Do you believe that is true? Not at all. I, I don't think, I, I think that while I am not a fan of necessarily the execution of his prequel trilogy, I think the story of the prequel trilogy about how democracy dies to be replaced by a jackbooted dictatorship is more relevant than ever. And I think that that, that, that storyline will continue to be relevant as we move forward into the 2020s. And I think, in, in, like all great science fiction, it was very uh, prescient of, uh, of, of the times we're living in now. So if anything, while because of George Lucas's his removal from the rest of the human race, because he couldn't walk out of his house and go to Starbucks without getting mobbed, and maybe the subtle nuances of human behavior were lost upon him when he made the Star Wars prequel trilogy. I think the storyline that's being told, the actual tale of all three films, Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, and uh, the Revenge of the Sith, are very relevant and maybe the most Star Wars story ever told. It's just that it's the... It's the, it's the minutia the nitty-gritty like the characters and dialogue that or like the work. plot of the entire first movie that could have been summed up in an act perhaps <laughs> i mean I'm, I'm a big fan of the machete order of the star wars movies which eliminates phantom menace entirely yeah uh well that was one of my questions and mr chato we didn't get to that there's this thing called the phantom edit that you have hardcore fans who in 1999 were rabid for new star wars content they were primed they were waiting in line may 1999 many of them walk out of the theater upset for several reasons jar jar banks is one the young anakin portrayal that we have such long screen time with the young boy who people just didn't resonate with a lot of the audience or particular people. And so my question was, we have this popular thing called the Phantom Edit that Mr. Chato has seen. You, you Mr. Burnett, you'd rather just not see episode one at all? Is that is that your preference? Uh, well, I, I don't know if it's necessarily a preference, but as my esteemed colleague Become the Knight pointed out, there's not a whole lot in that film. I mean, look, there's some great joys to be had, such as the duel with Darth Maul on um, Fabulous. Naboo. Uh, I really do enjoy that. Um, unfortunately, that we tragically lose Qui-Gon Jinn. I do think I really do like R2-D2 going out on the exterior of Queen Amidala's starship and saving the day, you know, and I, I, uh, I, I enjoy a, a lot of that movie. I enjoy Brian Blessed as... Uh, the leader of the Gungans. And uh, I, I uh, think that, um, you know, there's some joy to be had there. But here's the thing. The one thing that George Lucas always thought, he thought he was making his movies for children. And I don't think he expected adults to embrace them. And I think if you've ever watched The Phantom Menace with a child and seen that film through a child's eyes, there is a lot of value in that movie for children. I saw Star Wars when I was 10 years old and took it very seriously. Um, I don't know if I would have had the same response if I was five or six to Star Wars, the original. But I've seen young kids watch Star Wars The Phantom Menace for the first time, and there is wonder and awe in their eyes. And I think for that reason alone, The Phantom Menace has value. It appears you I are muted in some way. It was our oh, Matt. Yeah. Matt, you're muted, man. Matt, Matt, you're uh, muted. Matt, we can't hear I you. I can attempt to decipher based on the hand movements. Please, yeah, was, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was anything, a genius piece of questioning. Anything from our expert hey. witnesses. You know, you're ex just because you were a witness, both of you were witnesses for the defense, doesn't mean you're actually 
on the side of the defense. If uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Pro or Mr. Chato would like to speak of their own minds now that they're no longer uh, witnesses for the defense, they may speak freely right now. In fairness, Matt Matt is now unmuted. So. Oh, okay. Sorry, uh, Mr. Matt. Go right ahead. Yep. Nope. Still. No, you're nope. still muted. Still, you're still yeah. muted. Yeah. Yeah. muted. Uh, let's go to your your Mr. Chato and Mr. Pro. If you'd like to express yourselves freely at this time. Uh, from an executive point of view, I would say that nobody tries to make bad movies. I would say that uh, the Phantom Edit is a good example of... It appears that technical issues have uh, beset us yet again. Uh, can't hear me? No, oh, we can't. I, can hear, I can hear you. Oh, that's too yeah, bad. I mean. um, and, and the Phantom Edit is perfect proof that uh, George uh, overextended his hand. And someone else came in and actually did a much better job of pulling together what were ostensibly very good pieces. Uh, he even hired, I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the young Luke was a wretched actor that he hired. So, again, my point is that nothing is uh, infallible. Nobody is infallible, as, as we all know. Uh, no one knows anything in Hollywood. And uh, Disney did not purposely go out to destroy what... Uh, what Lucas has done, and I would say uh, Mr. Knight there is, is is correct, that he had already set the stage for some very bad pieces for the list, Disney's trilogy. And and if, if Qui-Gon uh, Jinn had not died, then Liam Neeson would maybe not have gone on to do all those crappy films. <laughs> and what <laughs> I would say is that... that uh, Sorry, I, I would Paul simply... Yeah. Yeah, let's let's play it again. Go for it. Let me just ask Paul a question, but then, sure. you, you know, I guess my point or my issue here is, you know, is it, is it of your, is it your impression that maybe uh, Star Wars should have been taken out of the hands of George Lucas long ago, uh, that, that he had, that he had been misguided in, in the way he had, he had put the, the prequels out and that there, that, that for us to kind of, uh, Sol solely placed George Lucas as the arbiter of the Star Wars universe for so long was that was that wrong for the fans to have done? I I th I think he kind of pulled together pulled it all together in Episode Three, but I would say that that is probably a fairly good assessment. Uh, we all viewed those three movies with a lot of shock because we went, uh, okay, what what fell off? What wheels fell off this wagon here? Who was responsible for it? Uh, what what happened to Star Wars? Um, if I can make a quick observation, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong. It seems that though, as though George Lucas is a better producer than he is writer and director. Does that does that sound accurate? Well, he certainly has the universe in his mind, okay. and and I think someone else needed to take that universe, copy it down into a script, and and make it more coherent. But, and, and again, he was given so much power, he owned the franchise, and I think episode one is a grand example of hubris. Yeah. All right, so now to give my thoughts on this, after the uh, esteemed commentary by Mr. Chetto himself. Thank you. I would simply say that the Walt Disney Company was primed and ready to go as a vehicle for distributing this franchise when it was originally purchased. That's why so many people were so excited that this was occurring. Uh, it is correct that many thought that George Lucas had went so far astray that perhaps uh, the Walt Disney Company would be a salvation for the franchise and bring it back to prominence. And that, uh, that goodwill was granted by the market in terms of The Force Awakens. What happened afterwards, though, is that Star Wars Lucasfilm and the Walt Disney Company have been fully determined to not take our money. They apparently do not want our money. And I say that in the same way that I would say that if someone were to purchase the Batman franchise then refuse to give you Batman, then clearly they just don't care about the cash. Lucasfilm could simply give us the original characters in the way that we wish to have them. Or they could choose to revere the things that George Lucas did well, which is what the fans revere but they are determined not to do so. Instead, we get things that people don't want. Nobody wants the Ray movie, at least very few do. And when it comes to the Mandalorian and these other entities, we all wanted to see Baby Yoda being trained by Luke Skywalker, but nay, we received 
Only a single episode in the Book of Boba Fett, an otherwise terrible and dreary version of the, the uh, character Boba Fett from the original trilogy. It seems that Disney enjoys killing our favorite heroes in ways that are unbecoming of them. Han is killed as a deadbeat dad. Luke dies of force constipation. And Leia, well, she just fades away. None of them get to see the victory. None of them go into the promised land. Disney needs to fix that if they ever wish for this franchise to be great once more. And if they do that, then the company still stands as the best chance to produce content in mass and distribute it all over the world. But I fear that they are not going to do that because I do not see evidence based on their actions in the past and their actions going forward that would indicate that they care about Star Wars. When it was brought up the High Republic while I was here today, I was reminded of just how revolting this whole thing is. And to conclude my thoughts on that, to give you some idea of just how poorly received the High Republic is, and by the way, that's where the Acolyte is going, thank God that Kathleen Kennedy found the one person who could produce the Acolyte for us, none other than the personal assistant of Harvey Weinstein. No one else could do such a thing. <laughs> but... To give you some idea of just how poorly received the whole deal is, Barnes & Noble signed a contract with Lucasfilm. That contract placed the High Republic on their in-cap spaces inside their stores, the most coveted space in the retail section of the bookstore. However, they quickly found that the High Republic would not sell, and so they found a loophole that allowed them to put Timothy Zahn novels all over the in-cap space and lay the High Republic books on the floor. That is a great metaphor, a great symbolism for what the Walt Disney Company has done. Can it be redeemed? Yes. But direction would have to strongly change. I'd, I'd uh, like to point out that WDW Pro has become a hostile witness. I was going to say, are you pr prosecution or defense here, brother? <laughs> oh, Disney, Disney can still do this. Disney can still do this. But they, I mean, the, I, the time is running that, out. I agree it is technically possible. I mean... They, they can still resurrect this. I think it's it's very possible. That is correct. Well, I think that the, the real problem with a company like Disney is their agenda uh, is to create uh, material that works over a number of different platforms. So uh, in terms of first and foremost being for children, uh, obviously they want it to be for Quadrant Entertainment. But when you're dealing with a story that's essentially about war and rebellion, um, it's interesting to to think a lot of people think that Star Wars was this mirth filled childhood fantasy when in actuality uh, billions of people die in the first Star Wars movie. Uh, we watch many, many people get killed, both in the Battle of Yavin and also on the Battle of the Blockade Runner in the beginning. And it, it's fairly adult minded when you walk into um, the cantina on Moss Eisley. Things like racism against droids are brought up. You have two uh, two alien sisters who look look over like a, a morsel. Uh, who knows what they were going to do with him? You had Ponda <laughs> Baba and uh, and uh, Doctor Evazen ready to. Uh, 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 Kenobi cuts off the arm of, of is it Ponda Baba? Is it Ponda Baba? Uh, cuts off name. his arm. And I mean, Star Wars is a violent, terrifying place sand people there are slavers there's all kinds of things and disney since they have taken over the franchise have done everything they can to soft pedal the more unsavory elements that wouldn't necessarily i mean they 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 are not really interested in telling the kinds of stories that fans are interested in hearing because they have to soft pedal the more unsavory elements of the star wars universe I Which think is, I, I think Disney Disney could reverse the whole thing if Kathleen Kennedy would dress up in the Leia uh, uh, slave <laughs> bikini. You've you gone too far, sir. The, the hut, the hut slave bikini. The hut slave bikini. If KK went in the, if she dressed up in the slave bikini, then we'd know they're on the right track. That's all I'm saying. Ob objection: Zero people want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to see that. I don't know. Have you seen the cover of the new Sports Illustrated? Woo! Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather, uh, I'd rather see Al Alan's uh, photoshopped suction thing again. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, we're uh, we're getting close to two hours in in our uh, court session. 
if we could move to any sort of final arguments or debates, uh, specifically sticking to the fraudulent misuse of Canon. Uh, we have a poll that is currently running in the chat. Uh, when we get to Super Chats, we will present the results of that troll, uh, that troll, that poll, excuse me, for misspeaking there. Could be something of a, a troll. But uh, uh, any final arguments or things you would like to put forth yeah, before I, we end today's session in court? And, I, and it's, it's open debate now, so I, final I th arguments. I think we should give Kathleen Kennedy credit for not bringing the Ewoks back. Yeah, okay. That's fair. And, and I have an electric guitar, too, so bite me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and remember, Kathleen Kennedy was hired by George Lucas before the sale of Lucasfilm. Correct. True. And also, <laughs> I, I think I think that Kathleen Kennedy, one of the reasons I, I'm a staunch defender of her is she had to deal first and foremost with Disney's corporate agenda as to what they expected from their acquisition. And so Kathleen Kennedy was never necessarily in a position where she could defend, and maybe she has tried to, but we don't know. And if you really look at what Kathleen Kennedy tried to do when she first started out, she is a producer that is used to hiring visionary directors and supporting those directors. But when War Lord Miller took over Solo, she wasn't expecting them to go off book and spend so much time improvising. She wasn't used to that. And it was a painful, hard decision for her to replace Lord Miller but she did try and get some really interesting directors to come in. It just didn't work out the way she wanted to, but she did try. And I think a lot of what she was facing was an uphill battle with Disney corporate. And what Let they me take a tremendous risk and push back on, on that statement and see what you do with this. Let me get your thoughts. If that is true, if Kathleen Kennedy is so superb in what she does, then why was she so poor in her judgment as to the, the success of The Last Jedi and Ryan Johnson and seems to have granted him a trilogy before we had even seen the results of what the market would say about that movie that then had to be walked back over many, many years? What do you make of that? Well, okay, that's a good question. I think Kathleen Kennedy would say that they made a great film. I think she would say even today they made a great film um, because I think that unfortunately here's, here's, here's what I would, I think they made a film that was daring in certain respects, uh, especially in terms of what they do with Luke. Remember Ryan Johnson didn't put Luke on Achito. That was something JJ Abrams did. So Ryan Johnson was saddled with the question, well, why would Luke wind up as a hermit on an Island? He didn't create that scenario. He was presented with that scenario. And I think in having to do that, um, he did the best he could in terms of trying to come up. Now, do I did I buy it? Not necessarily. But I think at the end of that movie, Luke Skywalker, as a Jedi, does one of the most baller Jedi things ever in that he defeats Kylo Ren and the Empire or at least allows the Resistance to escape. And he's not even there. And that, I in terms that was of pretty cool. in, in terms yeah. of using the force for defense, that's a pretty strong way to go out. Um, I think there's a lot of other problems that the Last Jedi has, but I think that they thought they made a good film, and and again, it was they thought they made a good film for maybe a, a perspective of filmmaking as a Star Wars movie, maybe not so much. But there's a lot of times that studio executives are out of touch with necessarily what a fan base wants. How is it that Mark Hamill was able to identify during the production of it that we have a real problem here, but they were not? Well, because, you know, Luke, Luke Mark Hamill is... But the thing is, we here's just, the thing. We just switch sides, man. Uh, but <laughs> but actors... I know, right? Oh, wait, Disney can still bring it back. Oh, Disney can still this. bring it back. Pro's, no, pros going to wiggle I, it back. The, the substance is more important than anything, honestly. I mean, I would say that I would say that Luke Skywalker is the, the person who knows Luke Skywalker best is in fact, Mark Hamill. And I personally, I, I am not a fan of Disney's uh, trilogy at all. And I think that um, what they decided he's talking about switching sides, what they decided to do was, was gross misconduct. 
uh, with with a story a story that that could have been. Here's here's the thing: if you go back to the extended universe, there's so much material now that they're picking and choosing, cherry picking what they think is the best stuff. They could have gone back because the people that wrote a lot of those, especially the early novels, and even the Dark Empire comic series. There was so much stuff in those comics that were thought more about than J.J. Abrams ever thought about these things because the people that write tie-in fiction now spend way more time thinking about the universe and the, the characters than the people writing movies. And it's frustrating. And we're seeing it with Star Trek Strange New Worlds. They are cherry-picking from great science fiction novels and Star Trek novels without accreditation of anyone. They're just taking these things when they should be giving story credit to Ursula K. Le Guin or Dorothy Fontana, and they are not. Just to give uh, you an idea of how bad The Last Jedi was and the damage that it did to the uh, the franchise, although, let me say again, Disney could bring it back. If I were to ask each of you on this panel, in this courtroom at this time, which you would rather watch, The Last Jedi or The Garbage Pail Kids, I grant <laughs> you that you'd have to give some real thought to it. So there you go. So so let me let me add something uh, as as a creative person, and and I I thought watching the Phantom Men, uh, no, the J.J. Uh, Abrams one, the uh, Force Awakens, Force Awakens. I, I can never remember the titles anymore. You're good. Aging uh, is that watching that movie? I will guarantee you, J.J. Abrams started with the vision, the picture of Lena uh Triumph of the Will, and Ooh. he went, wow. That picture with the red, with the red drape, uh, the red banners and the white stormtroopers and the black background. I'm going, I'm writing a movie around that. That's why I'm resurrecting, <laughs> you know, the Empire out of convenience because that is the picture I'm starting with. And then I'm going to uh, flesh out the beginning and I'm going to create an ending for it. But it, that, that was so out of place in the movie. And so spectacular, I am absolutely certain that that was the first thing on his mind. And that's what he built the movie around, because he's a shallow person. Uh, real, real quick, uh, real quick, um, we did a poll in the chat of who do you think is winning this debate in the, the trial? We just ended the poll mere moments ago uh, out of 660 votes. And I should know that there are wow. 1,100 1, people watching right now. But only six hundred and sixty people voted. So that's just still saying. a high. That's still a high sample. That's a high sample. Seventy-four uh, percent believe that the prosecution made a better case. Uh, I'd no say bias that here. that means exactly. That means that twenty-six <laughs> percent think that the defense did a very good job, which I think you know there's a lot of bias um, against the you know, the, the Disney Star Wars sequel film. So 26% is pretty good. We're going to be doing this poll every week just to see how people are doing. Any final, th how, how the, the prosecution defense is doing. So I, I, I definitely want to invite some of you back uh, next week. We're going to be rotating in some new people. You're going to have uh, some returning people as well. People have asked for Anna, that Star Wars girl to return. Uh, Robert, I know you're a busy gentleman. Love to have you back at some point. Depending on what we're uh, discussing, uh, uh, you know, we're all invited back on a future episode. Uh, any final thoughts before I move to our final comments via the chat? The the last thought I would impart on people is, hey, don't forget we were pissed off at George for a long time, and we got really excited when Disney took it over, and we got pissed off again. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be pissed off. I'm just saying let's think about who where this all started and have a bigger picture without rose colored glasses of just how much crap has been thrown into this universe. And remember it's science fantasy. So, you know, chill, maybe it's possible. Yeah. All right. We're going to go to chat comments and questions. You're, you're welcome. If you have uh, other, other courtroom business to take care of and, and another trial, you're well, you're welcome to be dismissed. <laughs> Uh, some of these questions address arguments. I don't see any that necessarily uh, uh, are directed at any particular person. I'm just going to go through these quickly. And I want to thank everyone on the defense and the prosecution for taking these proceedings very seriously today. This trial will continue over the coming weeks, going through each count. We're going to have a very epic, epic 
closing arguments. And it's very possible, I'm trying to work this out, it's very possible that the trial could end right in oddly in time with San Diego Comic-Con. We might do this live during San Diego Comic-Con for the final final results of the trial. But um, uh, Mr. Ng and I are having discussions about this at this time, but let me, I, let me. I do have to go to the courtroom next door because I'm charged with rear-ending Ellen DeGeneres's car on Melrose. <laughs> so, so at least right. you're not charged with rear-ending rear ending her. <laughs> well, there, there you she, go. She wouldn't have let me. Exactly. We, we, thank you, Mr. Chado, for your attendance. We appreciate uh, your expert testimony and your humor. Take care, thank sir. You. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Always good to see uh, you. Okay. Andrew Monpetit for 10. Question for the court. Who has the authority to determine canon? Is canon tied to anything pre-established, no matter how outlandish, or whomever currently owns the franchise? Well, here's what I'll say. You are the jury. You decide who made the better argument, the prosecution or the defense. So it's really up to you because you will ultimately decide. Big Worm for 10. Intent matters Force is female shirts were worn for a reason. They weren't promoting Nike. That's patently absurd. They were promoting Star Wars. She can say what, whatever she wants later on Live Long and Prosper. Uh, pseudonym for five. Y'all got too much free time. This is crazy. <laughs> you want to see aliens? Just look at the USA southern border. Plenty of aliens there. The illegal kind. Well, that's uh, not up for debate in this courtroom. Thank you for the five. Um, Death Racer 777 for five. The force is not female or male. Anyone making claims either way is being ridiculous. 200 Watt Studio for five. George is a huge film history fan. Jar Jar was Buster Keaton in the general. I have heard that before. <laughs> I've really? also heard that Jar Jar was Goofy, the Disney animated character based on Goofy with the big floppy ears. I love The General. I have seen that every time The General plays in theaters with a live organ because it's a silent film. That is probably one of the greatest silent movies ever made. If you've never seen The General, I'm sure, Rob, you would agree. Yes, absolutely. What a great movie. Um, I miss the silent movie theater in Los Angeles. Kevin Rubio for five. Tag and Bink are canon. Ergo, Manny is canon. Maybe... And or season two. Does Kevin know something we don't? <laughs> we shall see. Uh, William Sleeper for four ninety nine. I read the Legends Kenobi book previously referenced. Amazing. They had the storyline for that series and chose not to use it. By the way, it never left Tatooine. Cardinal Sin for four ninety nine. George Lucas said of the prequels, "I wouldn't let my children watch them." Uh, did he really wow. say that? It's interesting. Uh, the Icelandic <laughs> Filipino for 300. Mr. Ng, do you know what that is? The Icelandic Kronas? Is that it? For I it's, believe. Uh, okay. Well, thank you for that, Icelandic Filipino. Both the sequel and prequel weren't needed. There you go. 200 Watt Studio for five. George Lucas is the Michael Keaton character in Night Shift. An idea man. Nergenics for 199 says someone justify KK's there's no source material. Anyone care to address that when she's been quoted as saying there was no source material for Star Wars? We didn't have extra, you know. She was drunk. Story. Face closed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. I, I didn't look particularly into that one. Uh, uh, I wish I could uh, at least try and make some argument, but I, I'm not familiar. Uh, 200 Watt Studio for two. Force Awakens is better than to live and die in L.A. Uh, I don't know that I would agree with that. Nergenics for 499 says recommendation for the defense Mauler's review YouTube series of The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi. Uh, the uh, the uh, ST is he means Star Trek? That's I was thinking sequel ST. trilogy. Sequel trilogy. See, I don't think of it that way. Uh, so, uh, oh, we lost Rob. Uh oh, no, uh, the sequel trilogy is objectively poor written, it's factual. And Jake Damon for, for 199, the sequels were just soulless. Some quick comments here. Hopefully, Rob will make it back. Um, the Lost Tales Threat Level 1 has been a member for four months and says, Hail Film Threat and guests, you are all amazing. I do want to compliment our guests today on both the prosecution and the defense. Fantastic work today. Thank you 
really, really stellar. Thank um, thank you to all our mods, Lord Thoth, the Chicago Box, Gritterin Masters. Thank you, uh, Mick. Mr. Buttcrack Media Threat Level One has been a member for three months. Says, Hail to Judge Gore and the panel. Thank you. And I will say this if you're a member of the channel and you want to continue this conversation, if you become a member of the Film Threat YouTube channel, you will get access to our you will get access to our Discord. On the there's a link to the Film Threat Discord, Mr. Ring. If you could make sure that's an updated link. Um, you'll get yeah. access to the Discord. You, we have a whole Critics Court forum. You can continue this discussion. So become a member of the Film Threat YouTube channel. In addition, when we go to jury deliberations, we are going to be bringing on people from the chat on the show. When we go to jury deliberations, if you're a member of the chat, you'll get the StreamYard link. You'll be able to come on. We're going to rotate as many people in who are members as possible. That'll be happening sometime in july uh, also latino slant thank you paulie is also a mod always love to chat and hang out with paulie he's good people and a great youtube channel uh gary's wizard beard threat level two says it's been a member for a month says diogenes of sinope would have stopped searching when he met robert meyer burnett well there you go uh any comments sir uh thank you i don't know <laughs> i don't know who that is Diogenes is of Sinope. I'm missing that. I got to figure yeah. out what the, I, I'm going to use the newfangled thing called the internet and find out what that means. Well, it's rare, Rob, to see you that not get a reference. That is a rare. I think this might be the first time I've seen it in forever. I can't. You, you, you know everything. Yeah, but at least he admits well, it, which he'd be a bad politician. You know, it, okay, this is pretty great. <laughs> the most illustrious of the cynic philosophers. He serves as the template for the cynic sage in antiquity. This is a good one. Oh, I love this. I mean, um, uh, the alleged student of Antisthenes, Diogenes maintains his teacher's aestheticism and emphasis on ethics, but brings to these philo philosophical positions a dynamism and sense of humor unrivaled in the history of philosophy. I don't know if this guy would have wanted me to work for him. I don't think I'm worthy, but thank you. That's amazing. And I learned something today. 200 Watt Studio for two says, just kidding, Rob. Lol. I think, um, look, there were uh, the chat was on fire today, and, and I appreciate it. I just love all the participation. William Sleeper for 499 says, just FYI, Walt Disney has like 10 writing credits, but 700 plus producing credits. A few more here, a few more here, and we'll wrap up. Larry Larry, Threat Level 1, has been a member for four months, says, George Lucas is canon. What he approved is canon. Gary's wizard. Uh, oh, wait, got to that oh, one. Yeah. Ghost Rider Threat Level One has been a member for three months. Says RMB, champion of true creative talent everywhere. And Lynn Green says if you could reach him and he has the time, uh, TY Beard might be a good lawyer. Senior partner Beard Harris, friend of R Rakeda Law. Nick Rakeda, uh, I hope to have on the show. At some point in the future, uh, getting Nick Ricada. Jake Damon for 199 says, I just farted, which proves that we will <laughs> throw up any of these. Great job and show all. RMB is the goat, says Jay Tapia for 199. I don't know, man. I think my esteemed colleagues did a hell of a job. Uh, I, 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 I actually uh, I mean, have come to compliment on uh, you, you, Mr. You did, guys did an awesome job. Yeah, like uh, I wasn't even gonna be. I wasn't even gonna prosecute today. Yeah, you were supposed to be the defense today. I was gonna well, be the defense. Was, I mean, become um, the knights. I was all about his his um his uh his Google Google thing. I'm like, oh man, this is you put a lot of thought into this. Well, <laughs> it's my intention. I have not made a secret about this. My intention is to get people who disagree to talk to each other and have these debates. Yes, it's in the form of a courtroom, but as Mr. Burnett knows. Rob knows my friend for going on 30 years. Uh, Rob, uh, we have had so many debates at <laughs> Comic Cons, and at no point did you and I ever think that we wouldn't be friends because of debates. That we would never. We disagree well, with except you. with what you said about Space 1999. Well, Space 1999. Okay, I stand corrected. <laughs> but uh, look, but we're still we still talk to each other, and I think we live at a time where people. Um, 
you know, we should be able to disagree and not be called names. Uh, there are very, some very destructive and dangerous names being sort of bandied about in a, in a casual way. And I think this is not this is not good for fandom. I want to get us back to a fandom that can disagree and coexist. And that is the goal, the ultimate goal of Critics Court. We will be back next week, a week from today, Wednesday, 1 p.m. Pacific time, 4 p.m. Eastern. We will be debating charge number three. Some of your favorite YouTubers that you know will be joining. We may have some returning people as well based on schedule. Uh, let me know if, you, if you're able. We are working out the technical difficulties. We had some technical difficulties. Mr. Matt, I think you had a very good presentation in spite of technical difficulties. Mr. Knight, you put a lot of work in. I'm glad you're able to share it. Uh, the, a few final things. RMB got destroyed, says Mega YouTube 99 for 199. Not sure the chat agrees with you. I'll just say that. RMB, will they be a Rob Observations tonight? 200 Watt Studio for two. Uh, Rob, please. Yes. So tonight on my own channel on YouTube, The Burnett Work, I am having uh, David Goodman, who is the former president of the Writers Guild of America West, who is now the uh, co, uh, he's the co-head of the negotiating committee for the Writers Guild, is going to be on the channel tonight. And I'm actually teaming up with Gary Beekler, Nerdrotic, who actually kind of had this idea because he had contacted me about he's been doing these serious videos, pretty serious videos on the weekends. They're pretty well edited things. And he wanted to sort of delve into the whole Writers Guild, um, what's going on in a serious fashion. And I said, let me reach out. And I know David. And I think I think we're going to have a very substantive, very interesting conversation. So if anyone is interested in the Writers Guild, why they're striking, what they're striking about. Join us at 8 o'clock tonight on the Burnett Work, my YouTube channel, and Rob Observations. And we are going to have, I promise, what's going to be a very substantive, very uh, issue-oriented look into the Writers Guild strike and what it means for the future of Hollywood. Uh, that's Yes, I unfortunately I can't make I really wanted to be at that, but uh, it's going to be a great conversation. I'm just going to throw up Mr. Blackwood, uh, he's he's been drawing this entire uh, session of court. Look at that! Look at this that's great. great. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Uh, uh, please, Mr. Blackwood, post that on your uh, Instagram. You can follow you can follow him at uh, it is black Blackwood. Go to blackwoodpdx.com or at blackwood underscore pdx. Follow on Instagram for all the sketches from today's proceedings. Uh, we're going to, uh, just a few more real quick comments here. Madaween became a new member. We'll see you in the discord and everyone here. That's been a part of the show today. There's a discord invite. If you'd like to come to the critics court, uh, and just discuss, uh, discuss everything that happened today. Great job. Judge Frank Gore says J Tapia for one nine nine. Thank you for that. And uh, let's chat for the day. Disney Star Wars is all last chat for the day. Disney Star Wars. Disney is awful. Oh, wow. Thank you. Uh, J Tapia one nine nine. And thank you, Mr. Blackwood. Uh, that's awesome. Critical drinker on prosecution. That could end up happening. I've reached out to some of your favorite YouTubers. Trust me, it's going to get interesting over the coming weeks. But that's it we for us for today. I want to thank everyone. Great job, everyone. Uh, see you on the other end. Uh, it's just, it's a great show. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Take care, everyone. See you next week. <laughs>